Alrighty, alrighty. So yesterday we did uh, some uh, explorations with energy, energy, and if you yeah look at a you know standard textbook effective neuroscience, uh, the main components of emotions are arousal and valence or sense of well-being. Um, one way of describing it is, yeah, energy and valence. So today we're going to go and explore the axis of valence. Of course, they're related. Of course, they're related. And uh, energy can modulate valence in interesting ways. And valence can have effects on energy. But ultimately, they are different facets or qualities of experience. And one of the things that I think makes the explorations here so interesting uh, with kind of like the desire, the, the full qualia mastery of not only knowing the states for ourselves, but also understanding them intellectually and finding how to use them for the benefit of, of others and ourselves, is that the intellectual understanding can go really deep, really deep. It's just something that of course, not everybody focuses on, but here we have the chance and opportunity, the aesthetic, to do so. And a tiny little bit of background is that uh, essentially I've been interested in valence for yeah 15 years or, or longer. And uh, early on at TRI, uh, Mike introduced the concept of the, the symmetry theory of valence, which was really interesting because it posits, okay, there's there's something mathematical about valence, about how good experience feels. Um, but at the time, it was still very abstract. It was based on this model of uh, formalism. It took some years to actually ground it in a way that, OK, now it actually has applications. So we can actually use this concept, um, this theory of, of, of symmetry and valence being connected for something that is uh, pragmatically helpful. So today, we're going to be exploring that. A very, very key concept introduced in Principia Qualia by, by Mike is uh, valence structuralism, which is the idea that the thing that makes an experience feels good or bad is not something like reinforcement learning or pain receptors or parts of the brain that get activated or something like that. The thing that makes an experience feels good or bad is its shape. But this is not something we usually represent explicitly. It's something you need to kind of learn to pay attention to. But it's very helpful. It's very helpful to know this. So that's just a little bit of background. So I want you to, uh, first of all, yeah, settle in and relax for a moment. Just sort of uh, feel your body and your current state of mind. So before I give you any pointers, we will just go through the different channels of experience. And I want you to pay attention to the feel, the texture of them so that we can revisit them later with pointers and see, see what the difference is. So first of all, in this breakdown, Shenzhen Yong uses this a lot. We break down experience into see, hear, feel, three main channels, and there is an inner and an outer component of each of those channels. So first, and you're encouraged to be with eyes closed, but can be open, no problem. 
outer field, so our outer sea, is what the world looks like when you open your eyes or when you're paying attention to your visual field as if you were looking at outside. So pay attention to the texture of your visual field for a moment. Now, inner C is like your inner eye, kind of like an internal mode of visualization. So pay attention a little bit to your inner eye, as it were, the screen of imagination. Now let's move on to outer here, which is uh, the sounds you hear from the physical world around you. That auditory field. What does it feel like? What is in it? What is its texture? Now pay attention to the inner here. That's kind of the, the auditory screen where inner dialogue happens. It's kind of like private cocoon of quasi auditory phenomena. What is its texture? What is the mood of that inner here? Now let's move on to outer feel. This is your sense of tactile sensations, including smell, actually. Outer feel, your sense of embodiment. How is that feeling? And then finally, inner feel. Inner feel, we could actually say it's the main emotional resonating board, as it were. A lot of uh, kind of inner proprioception, visceral sensations. And the overall kind of emotional quality of the body and its rhythms.
All right, so now that you have focused one at a time in some of the main channels of experience, you kind of check in with yourself how you feel in all of these modalities. Now I'll give you some pointers. So it sounds very woo, but it, I think it's very true, phenomenologically speaking, that we have the capacity to pick up on frequencies of experience. Yesterday we talked with Stephen Lehar and you know he was making all these analogies with sound and shape. Indeed there's a duality. The longer the shape, the more coarse, the lower the frequency. The higher the detail, the higher the frequency. If your world simulation is rendered with vibratory patterns, large structures will vibrate more slowly because the waves take longer to travel in them. So one thing I want you to work and play with for a little bit now is notice this duality, how when you tune in into a spatial structure, you're also tuning into a vibration. And when you're deciding to pay attention to a part of the spectrum of your experience, it also picks out spatial structure that correspond to those vibrations. These frequencies are a shared currency for the entire energy system. Because if two channels, let's say inner here and outer feel, for example, have elements that vibrate in the same way, have the same frequency, and you pay attention to them at the same time, they can turn into one thing. Cross-modal coupling. In fact, if you synchronize all of the channels and you were to tune into the lowest vibrations, that actually feels like tuning into the frequency of the universe. A base frequency that drives all of your world simulation. Like the lowest fundamental frequency of your life world.
So now that we have a feel for the duality between shape and vibration, size and frequency, and the channels of experience, now it's time to investigate the valence characteristics of these world simulations. Because if I just say symmetry is what makes it feel good or bad, it's unclear how does this cash out into feeling good or bad? How do I interpret an experience to say this is more or less symmetrical? What I worked on early on was conceptual frameworks to make sense of this. And the one we're going to be exploring today in depth is CDNS. Consonance, dissonance, noise signatures. So we start out with the spectrum of experience from the lowest vibrations to the highest vibrations. Try to get a feel for the energy distribution in that spectrum. You have an outline of your body that's low frequency. The whole body needs to vibrate slowly because the waves take time to travel throughout it. If you hear a squeaky sound in the distance, that's a high frequency component. Maybe my voice is uh, somewhere in the middle. In mathematics, there is this incredible correspondence between symmetry, the symmetry of a space, and the way in which moving throughout it keeps properties invariant. In our Euclidean space, you can move a triangle, you can rotate it, translate it, and its angles don't change. If you were on a surface with variable curvature, that wouldn't be true. So when I say more symmetrical states of consciousness feel better, that means when energy flows within it, the shapes remain the same. They don't need to be squashed and stressed or strained to move around. And therefore, there is no viscosity. There are no blockages. When I say a facet of my experience is very symmetrical, it means, therefore, energy can travel smoothly within it without reflections, refraction, diffractions, or tension, stress, strain, shear. The goal of something like jhana meditation or high valence, very high valence meditation is to smooth out every channel of your experience so that energy flows effortlessly. With no blockages, there is symmetry. If you have a space with no blockages, you energize it, is going to vibrate at its fundamental frequency and at its harmonics. 
that is the essence of consonance, the essence of consonance. So whenever there is consonance in the vibratory quality of your experience, you know there's symmetry underneath. So symmetry manifests as consonance in the vibratory qualities of your experience. A good exercise if there's ever distracting sounds because if the sounds can just be perceived as energy and let them flow freely throughout your world simulation, that can be a perfectly acceptable high valence state with a tiny pinch point, tiny pinch point, and that's fine. the origin of the breaking of the symmetry, but can be a very minor component of the experience. When there are knots in the energy body, that's also a source of stress and strain. Energy traveling may twist around and collide against itself. So knots are in a way a risk factor for dissonance. And dissonance is what arises when there are incompatible symmetries at the same time. Fighting each other out So now with this frame, we revisit, see, hear, feel. But I want you to pick out consonances and dissonances. So first, the uh, outer C. Notice that even though it is not an emotion. There's a sense in which the visual field can feel good or bad. Beauty. Beauty is a stress-free, relaxed organization of the visual field where energy flows smoothly. So beauty is a valence phenomenon. Now in your inner sea, if you conjure up a beautiful image, whether it's of a beautiful person or beautiful fire, beautiful flower, notice that the quality of beauty has to do with not so much the meaning of it as the way it allows energy flow. High enough grade of beauty, high grade beauty is actually healing for that purpose, for that reason, because it's a packet of very smoothly organized energy that functions as a source of negentropy for your body. And in fact, the jhanas are consciousness beautified. And at high enough doses, that's incredibly healing. because of the symmetry.
now focus on the auditory domain outer outer here probably the easiest to think of as a spectrum you've probably seen many spectral power distributions in your life notice the dissonances and the consonances in the auditory field and now for the inner inner here is your inner voice a scratchy or is it bubbly? Is it smooth or is it rough? That is what it gives it its valence. And now let's move to the outer feel if you feel some bug bites uh, well, probably all of us <laughs> those are generally high frequency dissonances also they create uh, some tension and stress and strain on the geometric arrangement around them that interrupts energy flow and they functions as a kind of wave emitter. So this framework can explain why mosquito bites are <laughs> so distracting. But also notice the low frequencies of your body. And if you feel well rested and settled, that feels good is the free flow of energy. If you feel restless and unsettled, notice the frequencies don't sync up with each other. Inner restlessness is a form of dissonance. It causes stress that needs to propagate out and be released somehow lest the negative valence uh, continues. Now focus on the inner feel. You feel warm and fuzzy. That is a kind of consonance, a kind of symmetry. If you feel queasy and And wounded, that's a kind of dissonance. It's a kind of interruption of the energy flow. Of course, all the channels are connected and energy flows from one to another, as well as the stress patterns and the geometries. Finally, the last component of the CDNS framework is noise. Noise is neutral in valence. In Buddhism, they talk about the quality of experience called Vedana, which is in effect valence. And they say there are three kinds. There is positive, negative, and neutral with a valence structuralist lens we think the neutral component is noise noise not understood in the sense of something annoying not at all not at all more just in the absence of a discernible signal The ocean right now has quite a bit of noise of that kind and noise can be energizing. And then being energized that can have valence effects, but intrinsically in its bare form, it's neutral in valence. 
So now, do a scan of what's noise, noiseful in your world simulation. And all of that would be kind of the more blunted or indifferent quality of your experience. So I find this very helpful because, oh yeah, the sound in the background here, this machine has a lot of noise, rhythm, it doesn't have much dissonance intrinsically, but the way it might distract and jitter your attention, that might be somewhat dissonant. Very helpful because all of a sudden you can diagnose and pinpoint what structure, what vibration is actually causing trouble in experience. So the thing I will do last in this meditation is walk you through strategies for tackling inner dissonance and there's many we could go an entire retreat just practicing dissonance management strategies so this is just a taste the simplest simplest and perhaps most effective way of dealing with dissonance is to focus, pay attention to pleasure. We have a habit of focusing on the negative. But remember, whatever you pay attention to gets amplified, gets energized, and its properties become passed on to other aspects of your experience. So if you notice any dissonance in your body, in your auditory or visual domain, now let's just practice for a few moments. Instead, just pay attention to what's pleasant of your experience. There's so much to find that is good in one's experience, almost all the time. We just don't pay attention to it. Now, the second strategy is if there's something dissonant in your experience, Rather than focusing on what's bad about it, you can focus on what's good about it, accepting its discomfort. Oftentimes there's something to learn from it, or there's something even entertaining about it. And that can change the whole mood, the whole quality of his experience. Allows you to do small edits. <laughs> if life gives you funky sounds, play funk.
Now another approach is, and this is possible with enough concentration, especially if the dissonance is not too complicated or unpredictable, if it's steady. What you can do is add an inverse wave to cancel it out, destructive interference. Might take a little bit of time, but with practice, your inner rhythm can become the inverse wave of the dissonance. When that happens, it just disappears. This technique can actually get you really high. <laughs> because with the release of the dissonance, there's uh, additional energy, and now it's in a smooth space. Now another, perhaps pretty interesting one, intellectually interesting if nothing else, is sometimes if there's multiple sources of dissonance, it is possible to pair two of them that happen to be consonant with each other. This doesn't work all the time because the wave characteristics don't always fit together, but sometimes, sometimes an emotional pain and uh, an auditory discomfort bound together actually feel pretty nice. You've got to be creative and open-minded in this exploration. Another technique is a little bit tricky. Maybe a last recourse is, uh, but sometimes it works very wonderfully. Is sometimes if you make a copy of the source of dissonance, it's possible to get a doubling and the doubling may have new harmonics that weren't present just in the source of dissonance. This is tricky because you're, <laughs> you're doubling the discomfort, but sometimes out of that, you get an emergent consonance, which balances it out. Alternatively, you can also, and this is from the, uh, the toolkit we've been building up with these meditations. You're going to use energy. You're going to apply energy to the source of dissonance and, and melt it. Or you can use the source of dissonance as a source of energy. You can go both ways. This is why it's, uh, this exploration is so creative, so open-ended. And in fact, I know advanced meditators who in fact feel grateful when they experience pain because they've developed the skills to use it as a source of energy. And energy is so valuable when you know how to skillfully use it. You can also use metta, loving kindness, and modes of attention in order to soften the source of dissonance. Now, the intuitive thing to do here is 
to send metta to the source of dissonance. But another technique that is kind of, kind of is counterintuitive, but sometimes works really well, is to position yourself in the source of dissonance and send metta from it. Sometimes that does the trick. This is very general because you can apply it all across the board. Even in representations of people inside of you, somebody is sending bad vibes to you, you can, of course, and traditionally recommend it, send metta to them. Sometimes that works. You can also imagine and play with the notion that the metta comes from them. It's a counterintuitive movement in the mind, but can really soften the sense of duality, reduce fabrication, and as a consequence, generate a sense of relief. And finally, you can also do nothing whenever you feel a conscious intention, you can drop it. In some cases, of course not always, but in some cases, the bulk of the dissonance from a particular source is actually the result of you resisting it or trying to fix it. It's a feedback loop, a non-linear wave that got started based on your the way you're relating to it. In that case, doing nothing will just let it dissipate. That's a very, very useful strategy to have in your toolkit. And now, to close the meditation, I want you to reconnect with the whole spectrum of experience that you currently have and notice how this meditation has affected it. How the practice and the knowledge of all these techniques and this uh, understanding of the workings of the mind. How does that feel? In particular, enjoy this sense of empowerment. Empowered to deal with and manage whatever comes up creatively and openly. And so now in your own time, start coming out of the meditation and in enormous gratitude for joining me in this journey. Thank you. Thank you.